Hi. Good to see you today. We will appreciate your prayers for the conference that's coming up. It wasn't a planned thing, but God is so good to work everything out for his glory. Um, God redeems everything. Had some issues recently with a shoulder that's um, not behaving, and uh, so is Mike. And we were joking with each other about what good we would be in the Dominican Republic building a cement block house with one arm, you know. Um, and then it was suggested, well, maybe there's something else you could do. And really within a day, um, the idea of a pastor's conference unfolded and the opportunity presented itself and within a day was confirmed. So uh, we're looking forward to that and really do covet your prayers for the entire DR mission and all that we'll be doing down there. This morning in the message, we're going to continue looking at the Five Foundations for a Healthy Church, which was the first sermon series that I ever preached here back in February of 2008. And if we, 10 years ago, I think what I'm doing now would have been called a remix, where you take something, the original, and you, and you add to it, and you flip it around a little bit, and you reproduce it, and you send it out again, and you've got yourself a whole new album. And uh, I don't even do albums anymore, of course. Um, this isn't a remix, really. This is somewhat of a consolidation, and certainly it is, a, it is a matter of review. Again, this morning, you're not going to hear anything probably that you haven't heard in the past, but sometimes it's worth reiterating the basics, particularly when it comes to the fundamental concept of worship. Like prayer, worship is one of those words that we might assume everybody understands or knows the definition to, and yet we probably should not. Uh, we should define the term before we move ahead. A.W. Tozier says, Worship is to feel in your heart and express in some appropriate manner a humbling but delightful sense of admiring awe and astonished wonder and overpowering love in the presence of that most ancient mystery, that majesty which philosophers call the first cause, but which we call our Father, which art in heaven. William Temple says, Worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open up the heart to the love of God, and to devote that will to the purpose of God. J.I. Packer says to worship God is to recognize his worth or worthiness, to look Godward and to acknowledge in all appropriate ways the value of what we see. And the Bible calls this activity glorifying God or giving glory to God and views it as the ultimate end and from one point of view, the chief duty of man. John Piper has defined worship in a way that synthesizes these three perspectives. He says, worship is an inward feeling that produces an outward action that reflects the worth of God. In its simplest form, worship is worth-ship. It is declaring in word and in deed the incredible value, incredible worth, of our God. That's what it is. Why is it foundational for a church or for church members? Why does it matter? Why do we worship? A lot of ways to answer that question. I, I'm going to give you just a couple of reasons this morning. Why should we worship? The first is because God tells us to. The second is because he's worthy. The first and best answer to why worship is that God in his word commands us to worship. Believing as we do that the scriptures are the inspired and authoritative word of God, when a command is uttered, we do our best to follow it. This command to worship God is for everyone. It's not reserved just for churchgoers, uh, religious folk. All creation is made for worship. Psalm 150, verse 6, says, Let everything that has breath praise. Psalm 96, 9 says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Psalm 99.5 says, Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, God says, You shall have no other gods before me. And when he says that, what he's saying is, You shall have me. Not that you shouldn't have other gods, but that you should have me. When Jesus, the Son of God, 
was tempted in the wilderness by his arch rival, the devil. He rebuked him with scripture, and he cited the book of Deuteronomy. He said, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So we worship God because he tells us to. But it's not like drudgery to worship God. Um, it's, it's not like something we don't want to do. It's not like the command to worship is the same as the parent's command to clean your room. Like, or it's not like the employer mandate that some of you are under that you have to take first aid and CPR again. You know, like, oh, I've got to worship again. I can't believe I have to do that. It's not like that at all. Worship isn't something that we do reluctantly, and it's not to be something that we do solely out of a sense of duty because we have to. Those who truly know God, those who know who he is, those who understand what he does and what he's done, worship because they know he deserves worship, because he is worthy of worship. He's not comparable to anything else that might capture our attention or our affection. No one and no thing matches the worth of the one true God. Psalm 86, verse 8 says, Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with your. The prophet Jeremiah wrote, There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations, and in all their kingdom, there is none like you. First Chronicles 16, borrowing language from Psalm 105, declares, For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. It needs to be held in awe above all gods. What is it that captures your attention? What is it that has your affection? To the extent that it's not God Almighty, God with a big G, it might be little God. You might hold those things in reverence and awe, but the Bible says that our God is to be held above all of them. For all the gods of the peoples, the word says, are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Plunder and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. It is not an overstatement to say that we exist to give glory to God. If you're sitting here this morning and you're wondering what is the meaning of life and why am I even in this place, I can tell you with confidence that you exist to give glory to God. It's not an overstatement either to say that your greatest fulfillment and deepest satisfaction in life will come when you do just that. Decide that you will live to give glory to God. And of course, the opposite of that is true. If you are here this morning and you feel that much of joy in living has evaded you, that uh, life for you is just a series of swings and misses, and it's not really working out the way that you want it to, and you're not particularly happy about things, would you consider this morning that if that's the case, you just might be spending your life worshiping the wrong thing? You might be worshiping wrong. Few would argue everyone worships something or some things, even folks who don't profess any sort of faith in God, who, who would say flat out that they are ungodly or atheist or whatnot. Even they worship something or some things. Everyone has objects or people or pursuits in their life that take on supreme value. At the same time, Whenever God does not occupy that place in our lives of supreme value, and to the extent that we devote ourselves inordinately to any treasure that is not God, the results are going to be inevitable feelings of emptiness and incompleteness. Why is that? It is because we are made by God, and we are made for God, and nothing else will fill up what some have termed that God-shaped hole that is in all of us. We are called to be filled with a living water, which is God. But as Jeremiah wrote, we have this tendency to dig for ourselves leaky 
cisterns, that we want our own water. and We want things our way. The water that we collect is not pure water. And it leaves us thirsty. This water comes from our human efforts. And our little collection efforts eventually run dry. God has better things in mind for us than that. He fashions us to find fulfillment in him. He fashions us to find fulfillment by leading lives that show off his incredible work. And that's what we're here to do. And that's what we should be thinking about on a regular basis. How am I, how is my life, the unique position that I find myself in, in a family or in a church or in a community or in a place of employment, how am I able to do good things and point to my Father in heaven so that he receives the glory for what I'm all about. How do I put the spotlight on God? How do I show off his goodness? Because he is worthy. And there, of course, there is no greater testament to God's worthiness than what we know about the gift of his son, Jesus. God, God gave us his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. He died our death. He took on himself our unrighteousness that we might receive his righteousness, and he's made us God's children, and he's made us heirs to eternal life. So do you wonder if God is worthy? The question would be, what more could he do for you? Do you wonder if God is trustworthy? What more could he do for you than what he has done? Which is forgive you of sin and make it possible for you to be saved and have eternal life and have abundant life in his presence even now. There is no greater proof of God's love or God's trustworthiness or God's worthiness than what he has done in Jesus. No greater reason for us to know that he's worthy of our worship, but he's not only worthy of our worship, he's worthy of our lives. That we understand Jesus to be both Savior and Lord. That he has saved us for service. Savior and Lord. That he has saved us for sanctification. Savior and Lord. Why do we worship him? Because he's worthy. Because he tells us to. That's why, a couple of the whys of worship. Let's think a little bit now about how. How do we worship him? Is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? It's not uncommon to hear people say, and I suspect you've heard people say this as well, I worship God in my own way. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I just worship God in my own way. I think I, I think I know what folks mean when they say, I worship God in my own way. I think it's fair to translate that like this. I worship God how I want to worship God. I worship God how I see fit. Or I worship God in the way that's most convenient for me. That is not a good starting place. I can say that, okay? Because if there is a God, and there is, and if he commands us to worship, and he does, wouldn't it follow that because he's God, he gets to tell us how to worship, right? Wouldn't that follow just sort of logically and naturally? So starting with ourselves and saying, I worship God in my own way is a dangerous starting spot. Instead, we need to start with God, and we need to ask the question, what is the worship that God desires? In fact, God does tell us how to worship. He tells us how to worship uh, and that, that's, that could be the subject of entire books. I'm not going to get deep into it, but I do want to just touch on four principles for worship that God has revealed to us. Four hows. Four how to worship. God desires for his children to worship corporately. And we've gone over this a lot in the last 10 years. A lot. The importance of corporate worship. I feel like we've gone over this so much that some of you have gone out and you have Hebrews 10, 25 tattooed on your body somewhere. And if you don't have it tattooed on your body, I wish you would tattoo it on your heart because it tells us not to neglect the assembling of ourselves together. It tells us about the importance of coming together regularly to worship. In common vernacular, Hebrews 10, 25 says, don't skip church. That's what it means. It is, it is written in the larger context of an epistle that was given to us to encourage us and exhort us to stay firm in the faith and not to fall away. And corporate worship is set forth in that particular passage of that epistle 
and remind us of one of the things that we need to do with regularity so that we won't wander away from God. We've got to come together in corporate worship. We've got to be faithful that way. Faithfulness requires consistency in worship attendance. If we say that we are faithful to God, we will be faithful in worship attendance. Now, right away, somebody's going to say, well, Pastor, I think you're crossing the line, and I think now you're getting over into this thing that you like to call legalism. You're trying to tell us what to do, and you're trying, and that's legalism, and, and you, know, you throw the flag. And I'm at Super Bowl Sunday, we just throw a flag. <clears throat> it's getting to the point in our culture where if anybody has a- anything definitive to say, even from the pulpit, we, we classify it as legalism. And I want to say that what I'm telling you is not legalism, it's obedience. But there's a difference between legalism and obedience. In legalism, we're trying to earn favor with God. And I am not saying that you have to come to worship all the time in order to earn favor with God. That's not at all what I'm saying. But the scripture tells us that we're supposed to not neglect the assembling of ourselves together. That is obedience, okay? That is the Great Commission, by the way, where Jesus says, go and make disciples. What's the purpose of making disciples? Teach them to obey all that I have commanded. We, we focus on the making disciples part, but Jesus goes on. Go, go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe, to obey all that I have commanded you. That God has saved us for service. He has saved us to obedience. All right? So if God commands it and we don't do it, what do we call that? sin. If God commands it and we don't do it, that is sin. Forsaking the habit of worship. Now, I have to stop here always when you talk about this stuff and just say, I'm not talking about missing an occasional Sunday. I'm not talking about not being here when something happens in your life and it makes it impossible for you to to come along. We have no attendance cops or anything to enforce this law. It's not a law. I'm not talking about those sorts of things. I'm talking about the habit of worship, right? And the Bible's telling us to stay in the habit of worship, routinely gathering, and when we don't, it's sin. And the Bible says not to do something and we do it, it's sin. Disobedience is sin. Willful disobedience is unrepentant sin. For a long time, the church in America has looked at this thing of of attendance And not as a matter of obedience, but much more as we are inclined to do because of how we're raised, sort of as a matter of individual preference. Well, if that's what you want to do, that's your business. But that's not how the Scripture puts it. The Scripture would call it sin. I would hope that if any of us is in unrepentant sin, that is, we're we're forsaking the habit of of, of worshiping, how many of you folks would come and gather us up, would have a word to say to us, would have an exhortation and encouragement? would ask some questions, and would talk with us about how important it is. We don't want any church member to be involved in unrepentant sin, do we? Churches everywhere are allowing members to live in unrepentant sin by not holding them accountable to attending worship on a regular basis. And here's why we shouldn't do that. Because when it comes to our regular presence in worship, the Bible teaches, one, that God deserves it, right? That he's worthy. I mean, just, can we just think about this for a second? What is it that keeps you from worship? What is it that drives you to worship? And if you really know Jesus, I mean you really know Jesus, how often do you have to look at him hanging bloody on a cross before you realize getting up to worship him is the right thing to do? For the life of me, I don't understand how we can claim to have a relationship with a risen Savior who gave his life for us and not make accommodation to worship him with regularity. He deserves it. He's worthy. So we come to worship, but beyond that, the Bible's teaching us in this Hebrew section, our brothers and sisters benefit from our presence. In other words, it's not just about me. It's not, it's not about what I get. It's not about my takeaway. Let me read the larger passage, Hebrews 10 23 to 25, says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
Worshiping together spurs all of us on to faithfulness. It encourages us in the faith. It's not about us. All the more as we see the day drawing near. All the more as we see uh, our culture sliding back. As we see history repeating itself. As we see this, this rush to godlessness. All the more we need to be encouraging one another to be here. Particularly when there are so many excuses not to be. So, many, so much at cost, so much at, at stake, really. Worshiping together spurs all of us on to faithfulness. It encourages all of us. And think about it this way. Your absence on a given Sunday might mean that somebody that day isn't getting what they need. If, if it's about spurring one another on and encouraging one another, but you're not here, then somebody, the odds are good, on any given Sunday, isn't going to get what God intends for them. Now that's for sure more than enough on the subject of corporate worship. Um, every time you preach about that, you preach to the people who seem to, to understand it because they're here. So you preach into the choir. But I would ask you this, those of you who know its worth, those of you know, who know how important it is to, to maintain the habit of regular worship, would you please consider exhorting those who don't? Would you, would you give some thought as to how you can speak into people's lives? If you know the worth of it, what are you going to say to those who proclaim to be Christians, but they don't? For too long, we Christians, perhaps for fear of man, or perhaps thinking we're being gentle or civil, have refused to speak our minds on certain topics and have allowed things are we not seeing the fruit of that in our society is not the level of godless banter at an all time high would it be that high if we Christians from time to time stood up and drew an unpopular line and said I know you don't want to hear this or I'm afraid you don't want to hear this. But this is what the Bible says. This is how we are to live. This is how we are to be. Use your voice. Use your words. This verb in, in Hebrews, to encourage, it means to come alongside somebody and encourage, uplift them with your words. Do that. If you know the value of corporate worship, exhort those who don't. So God wants us to worship cor corporately. That is not at the expense, of course, of individual worship. God wants us to worship individually as well. But it's just that our individual worship doesn't take the place of corporate worship because you'll hear people say that, well, I'm going to worship today outside on the backyard. I'm just going to go sit on a rock and worship God. Good. Do that. But don't do that when your body's gathering. Do that some other time. Do that in addition to your corporate worship. Again, because God desires corporate worship. He calls us to community, to live in community, to grow in community. So you can worship individually all you want. In fact, you should. We don't want to compartmentalize worship. Worship is like prayer. It's not something that you do on a Sunday or any given day. Worship is a lifestyle. We are constantly offering our praise to God. We are constantly thanking God. We are constantly going to God. That's what we should be doing. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, constantly offering ourselves to God in worship. We worship corporately as well as individually. Both are part of his expectation of worship. So in your quiet time, in your devotions, in your ride to work, whatever it is, worship God. But don't count that worship as, okay, now I don't have to go to corporate worship. It's not important for me to go to corporate worship. I'm concerned about online worship these days. I'm concerned that people today can log in, consider themselves to be part of a church, and log out. And that is not the biblical model of the church. Now, I'm grateful for opportunities to hear sermons and to grow in the Lord and to participate when we can't. But that's not a substitute, friend. Why is that going to be popular? Because it just moves us further and further away from realms of accountability and from doing the hard work of true relationship. But that's where the gospel is manifest, and that's where the gospel is proclaimed in the midst of messy people like us. 
where God is exalted. We worship corporately as well as individually. Both are part of his expectation. Either is incomplete, is less than ideal without the other. How else do we worship or how else can we worship in ways that please him? Jesus tells us it's recorded in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, a familiar piece of scripture. Jesus is talking with a Samaritan woman at the well. Been bantering a little bit, or she has, about religion and rules and things like that. And so in the 23rd verse, Jesus says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. I bring this to our attention because very often discussions about the how of worship center on issues of style and and on people's preferences much more than theological concerns. And if you've been in the church for any length of time, you've probably made your way through some of the worship wars, so you know what I'm talking about. We have folks who want the hymns, and we have folks who want the choruses, we have folks who want the organ or the piano, and folks who want the guitar and the drums, and we have folks who want liturgy, and we have folks who despise liturgy. Now... It's not a problem to like what you like. You don't have to feel bad about that. That's fine to like what you like. But when what we like becomes a standard for evaluating our worship, we cross the line. The key consideration that is missing from most clashes over worship, and you know this, I'm sure, is that worship is not about what I want. Worship is not about what you want. It's really always to be about what God wants about what pleases God. Author and educator Marva Dawn, in describing the provocative title of her book, Worship, A Royal Waste of Time, says God is the leader of worship. God is the heart of worship. God is the high priest of worship. God is the host of worship. God is a center of attention and focus at all times. So again, if it's about God, then the question is what is the worship God wants? What is the type of worshiper that God seeks? And Jesus answers that. He says, God wants those who worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, Jesus, what does that mean? There are a few words that come to mind right off the top of my head. One would be worship that is real. Worship that is authentic. Worship that is genuine. Worship in spirit and truth is not, as Jesus pointed out, offered by those who honor him with their lips or whose hearts are far from him. God doesn't want that. That doesn't need you coming in here singing a song on your lips but being far, far away from him in your heart. That's not honoring to him. It's not what he wants. Worship in spirit and truth is not made up of meaningless repetition in the traditions of men. Actually, the first foundation, well, the second foundation that I preached on so long ago was meaningful worship. Meaningful worship set over and against meaningless worship. When people say, well, what is meaningless worship? The, I could answer that in many, many ways, but I think I would, I would put it like this. You know it when you see it. If you've, if you've set in on some meaningless worship, on some rote repetition, on some lifeless, dead gathering, you know what meaningless worship is. You know it's not fun for you. It's not fun for anybody there. It's not glorifying God. What the heck are we doing? Might as well pull out the bingo card. Meaningless worship, that doesn't honor God. I want meaningful worship. And worship in spirit and truth is not made up of meaningless repetitions in the traditions of men. Interestingly and worthy of mention, author and musician Harold Vest notes this. He says, life is delightfully full of repetition. I personally am very grateful for the many repetitions of life, and I bet you find a lot of comfort in your routines as well. The repetitions and the refrains of life that come over and again, they're very nice and they're good. He says, life is delightfully full of repetitions, and we need them as much as we need complete newness, provided we keep the principle of faith at work in each repetition. Otherwise, we become guilty of vain repetition. So in worship, there are certain things we do over and again. And they're important. They lose their value. The principle of faith is not at work in them. They just become meaningless words. Jesus doesn't caution us against repetition in worship. He, causes, he cautions us against vain repetition. That's what he doesn't like. Going through the motions. Even when it comes to liturgy, which for Baptists we don't understand very well, but I can say liturgy can be very helpful as long as the principle of faith is at work in it. 
In Desiring God, John Piper writes this. He said, Worship must be vital and real in the heart, and worship must rest on a true perception of God. There must be spirit, and there must be truth. Truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy in a church full, and he puts in parentheses, or half full, of artificial admirers. And that's exactly right. Truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy. Dead orthodoxy does not multiply, does not perpetuate itself, runs its course. On the other hand, emotion without truth produces empty frenzy. Maybe you've worshipped in some of those environments as well. They get a little bit out of hand, maybe a little more charismatic than you like. And some of that is some of that is spirit led, and that's good. And some of it is truly empty frenzy. And it cultivates shallow people who refuse the discipline of rigorous thought. But true worship comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love deep and sound doctrine. Strong affections for God, rooted in truth, are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. This type of worship can take on many forms, beloved. It can be high church. It can be low church. It can be traditional. It can be contemporary. The commitment to spirit and truth says that God is and can be pleased with many different styles and forms of worship as long as those styles themselves don't become objects of worship. Years ago, we used to sing a song, When the Music Fades and All is Stripped Away. Right? That, that, that song was written because the worship leader, the pastor of that church, where the worship leader wrote that song, had come to realize that the style of worship was being worshipped. And so they just stopped singing for a while until they could get it back in balance. Very easy to lose sight and to elevate as an object of worship a particular style of worship. I think, at least my experience here in this church, is that we are, we're all right with this. We, we worship a little different in different services, and that's fine. We have our preferences. But I do sense, and hope it's true, that there's a level of maturity here in this church that we know that our primary purpose for worship is not about pleasing ourselves, and we also know that what makes it good is not doing what we please on any given Sunday, but doing what pleases God. And when you leave today and, and you sit with your family like they used to, most people don't do that anymore, and you have carved preacher for lunch, and you, you evaluate, maybe it does happen here, I don't think it does, but when you evaluate your experience, and you want, you want to weigh in as to whether you thought it was good or not. The real fundamental consideration is, was God honored? And would God be pleased with that? It doesn't have to score a 9 or an 8 or a 7.5 on your card. Was God honored? That's what makes worship good, right? Amen? Amen. Yeah, that's not a very hearty amen, folks. <laughs> I've heard better amens. To be honest. <laughs> Wrap this up, Scott, would you? <laughs> now they come. Now comes the amen. And in closing, I want to bring this thing to a close by speaking very briefly about one thing there are many, but I want to speak about one thing that has the potential to keep us from the worship that God desires. And I want to, I just kind of want to name this thing, and I, I want to lay it out there and also talk about how it can be overcome. Because what keeps us from worshiping as God wants us to? What keeps us from corporate worship, from individual worship, from worship in spirit and in truth? Lots of right answers, lots of reasons, but here's one that's fairly common, and I don't know that you've thought much about it. It is shame. There's one thing that keeps us from God on a consistent basis. Shame. And we can trace the origins of shame back to the Garden of Eden. When our first parents sinned and they disobeyed God, and, and when God came to them, they ran and hid from him. Some of the saddest scripture in the entire Bible. They were afraid when they heard God come. And, and like any child who's done something wrong, when you hear mom and dad approach, most of us have had that experience, we know that fear. It's a fear of punishment, kind of. But it's got something behind it, often. And that is shame. We're ashamed of what we've done. The dictionary defines shame as a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. 
While researching for this message, I came across a quotation. It said, worship is all we can do when faced with a sovereign God. Looking for definition of worship. Worship is all we can do when faced with a sovereign God. And I thought, well, in part that is true. We will worship. Everybody will worship. Regardless of how they think now, the scripture tells us in Philippians, there's going to come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But we will, when faced with a sovereign God, ultimately all bow down. But while we're here and while we're in the in-between, we have this life, this isn't always true, that when faced with a sovereign God, we, were, we will worship. We have other options. We have another option. There's something else we can do. We can run and hide. We can cower in fear and shame. Because the prospect of a holy God illuminates for us true unholiness. That perfect God, in his presence, my imperfection is going to be met. Many people who live with this innate sense of unworthiness and shame have concluded that God doesn't want anything to do with them. As a matter of self-protection, not having to deal with what it is that's keeping them from God, they decide they will have nothing to do with God. They never become believers. They just sort of decide, God doesn't want anything to do with me, so I'm not going to have anything to do with him. Many believers who have fallen away from the faith, making ungodly decisions, making sinful choices, they also feel shame. And what I've seen happen there is when you feel that shame, you, you make your way out to the edges of Christianity, so to speak. You don't worship the way that you used to. You don't come to church as much, if you come at all. You don't hang out with Christian friends the way that you used to. You don't read the Bible good. You don't pray to God like you once did. And clearly that shame is a wedge between them and the Lord. Both the unbeliever and the believer, I think, would have a similar thought about God in those times, if they're thinking of him at all. That if I'm ever going to have anything to do with God, well, I will get with him as soon as I make my life presentable. I, I, I need to clean myself up a little bit because a holy God wouldn't want anything to do with an unholy me. Or I'm a believer, but I've fallen away, and I know what I'm doing is wrong, so I need to fix that first. And then I'm going to come to him. Well, in March of last year, Misty Honnold wrote an article titled, Don't Wait Until You're Worthy to Worship God. So I'm just going to read that title again. Don't wait until you're worthy to worship God. She wrote this. She said, I used to clean houses for extra income. Time and time again, my clients would clean before I came to clean. Some of you clean for a living, and this happens, doesn't it? Some of the reason that we're not great at hospitality is because it means we have to clean. <laughs> I'm going to have company, goodness. Well, it's a good way to get the house clean, <laughs> whether the company comes or not, right? It's inspiration, isn't it, Joyce? At least a couple times a year. Yes. Apparently there was... I didn't mean you clean a couple times a year. I was thinking like Halloween and the... <laughs> See what happens when you go off script? So here's this person who used to clean houses. She said, people used to clean before I came to clean. She said, just as my clients were ashamed for me to see the pile of dirty dishes, unmade bed, piles of mail, even the dust bunnies in the corner, many people stay outside the gates of the presence of the Lord because they're trying to clean themselves up. He beckons us to come as we are. There's an old song called Come Ye Sinners. One of the lines says, If ye tarry, till you're better, you may never come at all. You're trying to get yourself cleaned up, you're doing something that's impossible. Old chapel speaker I heard once at Gordon College said of Jesus, Jesus tells us, he says, you catch the fish, I'll clean them. And I like that. All we're supposed to do is come to him, and the cleansing then is his to do in us. But we're trying to make ourselves presentable to a holy God. 
we'll never come. We'll never get better. We'll never be healed. We'll never be forgiven. We may never be saved. We're trying to make ourselves righteous. He writes, my clients would never receive the full benefit of my services while shame kept them from doing the work they paid me to do. As believers, we'll never receive the full benefits of the cross while we allow the unspoken bondage of shame to keep us closed in the closet or keep us striving to be worthy so we can worship the worthy one. Renee Brown says of shame, we all have it. The less we talk about it, the bigger it is. So let's bring shame out of the closet. Recognize that it's a real thing. It keeps us shackled to hiding or striving. Shame keeps us from living the abundant life that comes from knowing God. Shame keeps us from true worship. And I'm sure that you felt shame in your life. You may be feeling shame now. So what is the cure? How do we get past that? How do we get over it? How do we overcome it? I can tell you how not to first. The cure for shame is not redefining the choices and behaviors that separate you from God and saying they're okay when you know in your heart of hearts that they're not. That is what the world does. The world just wants to redefine the thing as if we could talk ourselves out of it, but we cannot. The cure for shame is the gospel. It's the reality, listen, it is the reality that an all-knowing God is fully aware of everything about you and loves you still. Fully aware of everything about you and loves you. God sent his son to die on the cross as a payment for your sins. Past, present. Leave it. Not condemn you. You may condemn yourself. He does not condemn you. If by faith you turn to him, Romans 8, 1 says it, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not only is there no condemnation, there is nothing that can or will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ. The Bible says, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. With that in mind, I want to make an appeal this morning to those who have never known Jesus as Lord and Savior, or to those who've fallen away and may be struggling with a load of guilt and shame. And in that way, some of you might be hiding in plain sight. And the appeal, which I believe is God's appeal, is this. Be reconciled. Reconciled to God. You were made by Him to worship Him. And you cannot do that if you are estranged from Him. So whether you have never sought or received for the forgiveness of Christ or, or you have strayed from the faith, know that fulfillment and the greatest pleasures in life are found near to him. Reconciled to God. This morning we're going to celebrate together the service of communion the Lord's table. Understand this, my friend, as an invitation. An invitation to be reconciled to God. Because the bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. The cup represents the blood of Christ that was spilled for us. In order that we might be reconciled to God. Whatever is in your life that is keeping you from Jesus. Give it up today. Let it go. Be his. Be his alone. Worship him with your whole life. Lord, you have gone to great lengths to reconcile a sinful people to yourself. We are the chief of sinners. 
And we have felt your grace and your mercy. We praise you and we thank you for that. You are worth so much more than our time on a Sunday morning. You are worth everything we have. For you have given everything you could give to make us your own. Lord, would the truth of that be received this day deep in our hearts. Deliver us from the self-condemnation that leads us to self-protection and keeps us from ever truly knowing or loving or receiving you. Break through those walls. Thank you for loving us. Even after you know us, you love us. Now grant us the faith to believe it. And Lord, as if we needed a sign, we have them this morning, in the bread and the cup.